Good afternoon and good evening to those of you in Europe and good morning to those of you in Australia and Japan. Welcome to session seven of the ESIG 2021 Meteorology and Market Design for Grid Services Workshop on the topic of impacts of forecasting on operations. I'm Charlie Smith, the Executive Director of ESIG, and I'll provide a few brief opening remarks. As I think you know by now, our workshop sessions are all being held online and are open to everyone. And I do want to let you know that we're planning our first major in-person event since the COVID outbreak last year with the Fall Technical Workshop in Austin, Texas, during the week of October 25th. Please mark your calendars and look for additional information in the near future. This workshop was planned with the input of our ESIG Offerings Committee, chaired by Bethany Fru of NREL and Julia Matoivasan of ERCOT. The committee consists of the chairs of our six working groups and several of our board members. We have a great set of volunteers who really make ESIG what it is, and we encourage you to become involved if you're not already. You can find us on the web at esig.energy, send an email to info at esig.energy to get our monthly newsletter, and follow our activities on LinkedIn, Facebook, and Twitter. ESIG also serves a leadership role in the Global Power System Transformation Consortium, often called GPST whose mission is to bring together key actors from around the world to catalyze a rapid clean energy transition at unprecedented scope and scale. ESIG leads one of the five pillars that deals with the research agenda for the system operators. More information on GPST can be found at globalpst.org. Regarding logistics for today, I would ask you to note that session seven will be an hour and a half long. We had a lot of feedback that our one hour workshop sessions were too rushed. So we've moved to some longer formats for this workshop. We'll have three individual presentations of approximately 15 to 20 minutes each in the first part of the session, followed by approximately 25 minutes of discussion and Q&A after the last speaker. As we're doing with all of our webinars now, we'll be using the Slido platform for managing the Q&A. You should go to slido.com on your device and enter ESIG22 as the event code to ask your questions. Please be sure to indicate the person to whom you're addressing the question. The instructions are also at the bottom of the background slide for the webinar, and you'll be reminded by the session chair. You'll see a thumbs up button next to the question on Slido to allow you to vote on prioritizing the questions submitted. So please keep the questions coming during the presentations, and we'll address them at the end. We'll follow up with any written questions. We'll follow up with any written answers to any questions we don't get to during the Q&A. Recognizing the limitations of a webinar with more than 100 people on the line, the lines will be muted. So again, we ask you to use the Slido platform to ask your questions with ESIG22 as the event code. Today's session is titled Impacts of Forecasting and Operations, an Operations Perspective. This is a topic affecting everyone who's operating a power system and one which goes back to the roots of this particular workshop series. We have a fine lineup of practitioners and participants from across the spectrum today who will explore different aspects of this topic, and I'm looking forward to a great session and discussion. The session will be chaired by Jay Caspery of Grid Strategies. Jay is a well-known figure in the system planning and operations space, having spent 20 years of his career with the Southwest Power Pool and prior to that, 20 years with Illinois Power. Jay also did a stint at DOE as a senior policy advisor in the Office of Electricity. He's a good friend, a regular contributor to ESIG activities, and is well known to many of you. He brings a lot of good experience and insight, and we're very happy to have him here with us today. Jay, we appreciate your participation, and I'll now turn it over to you. Thank you, Charlie, and welcome to everyone to session seven of this year's Meteorology and Market Design for Grid Services Workshop. I really appreciate working with Charlie and others at ESIG. It's been a highlight of my, my career. I'm excited about the future and I really appreciate the contributions provided by panelists like these today, as well as ESIG members and others that just participate in workshops such as this. As you can tell, this is a very timely and important topic on forecasting and its impacts on operations. Today, we have a great panel with perspectives from grid operations, a vendor of forecasting services, and a researcher at NREL. 
I want to keep my comments brief to allow more time with the experts and so that we can have a robust discussion at the end. Please put any questions and rankings in Slido. I will monitor that tool and use it for the Q&A session. I'll provide brief introductions as we get the slide deck set up and then shift the control over to the presenters. Our first presenter today is going to be Gunnar Schaefer. Gunnar's a friend. Gunnar obtained his Bachelor of Science in Engineering degree in Renewable Energy Power Systems from John Brown University and his Master's of Science in Renewable Energy Power Systems with an emphasis in both wind forecasting and batteries from the Universität Oldenburg in Germany. He has worked at the UN in Geneva, Switzerland and had five years of experience most recently at Southwest Power Pool, where he began his career in economic planning, moved over to market design, and most recently he has taken the position as a shift engineer in SPP real-time operations. Gunnar witnessed the winter storm Uri of 2021 firsthand while on the desk and brings a direct viewpoint from the control center for today's topic. With that, I'd like to introduce Gunnar. Good morning. Thank you, Jay. Let's get started. Okay, can you see me good? I can see you here fine. Too. I don't see your slides yet. Don't see my slides. Okay. There we go. You see him now. Perfect. Thank see you. See the mouse. Okay. So the discussion today that I'll be presenting is operating SPP through an extreme weather event. I'll focus a little bit on forecasting, and then I'll start off on what is SPP, especially if you're new to ESIG. Um, and then we'll go through the different resources, uh, the challenges that we had with those different resources. Um, and so I'll give some of my firsthand experience. So I walked in as soon as um, my shift went on um, when when the when the big panic um, kind of happened. So we'll talk through that and I'll go for about 20 minutes. Let's see. So if you uh, don't really know what SPP is, Southwest Power Pool, we control most of um, the Midwest from North Dakota to Texas. So we're on the left side of this chart, wholesale energy and transmission. We don't do anything on the retail or distribution side. So really you can view SPP as doing everything from managing the power plants, managing the substations, managing the transmission lines. We don't own anything on the left side. We don't own anything on the right side where the air traffic controllers of that. Now, when we get into really critical situations, we can then go to the next level and basically control some of the distribution through um, pro rata load shedding that we communicate with um, the, what are called TOPs and GOPs. Um, uh, transmission operators and generation operators. So that's really where SPP is, but we can go here and uh, we did it back in February for the first time in 80 years. So the big picture, um, <clears throat> you see those people over on the right side, they're the gossipers that you see on Facebook, Twitter, you know, LinkedIn, wherever you're seeing them at. But really SPP started on February the 4th, we issued a cold weather alert um, and the event was not till the 15th and 18th. So we knew at least over a week ahead that um, we might have some issues in the 10 day forecast. Um, we issued a resource alert. Then um, we committed long lead generation, such as long, long uh, lead you know, coal plants and things like that. Okay. Then we started public appeals. So demand dropped below forecasts um, simply because you saw it on the news. You got text messages to conserve power, um, turn off everything, don't take a shower, don't use your dishwasher. I thought there were some extreme um, examples, but that's what they put out. So, uh, but we used every megawatt we could get. We ran every available generator and we imported as much as we could from our neighbors. But as you can imagine, MISO was also suffering and so was ERCOT to the south in Texas. Um, in the end, the service interruptions um, happened on the 15th and the 16th. And they still weren't that much as a as a um, total of our load. The 15th was one and a half percent for less than an hour. And on the 16th, it was around 7% for around three hours. So I wouldn't call those large uh, disruptions. Of course, it was unfortunate for the, the people who experienced that, but that was much better than a blackout. So it was more of a controlled brownout. 
but really in the end, what we want to do is is um, create the collaboration necessary to prevent that. And so that's where all the TOPs and GOPs and the RCs, the balancing authorities, um, and the different RTOs were constantly in communication with, with each other. So this is a um, good map of SPP where we're at. We're right in the center. That is the, the uh, temperature forecast. So between the 14th and 16th of February, the entire footprint of SPP was below zero degrees. And you'll hear from ERCOT a little bit later on maybe some of their challenges. Um, they were also below zero or below 32 for much of the entire footprint. And that's really what caused the, the entire issue. So 73% of the US was covered in snow. Um, that's 3000 daily and 79 all time low temperature records broken. So that's that's really what we we're dealing with. A cold snap of a hundred year sort of um, historical time frame, which is just very hard to plan for. So we'll go right in. So what are the wind challenges? Immediately you have blade icing. There are different types of blade icing. You have cloud formation. You could have rain formation. You could have snow accumulation, melt, then turns to ice. There's many different things that cause that. But what you have next is really turbines faulting due to uneven icing inducing vibrations. That's one of the reasons why the turbines actually fault. It's not necessarily because the weight of the ice. It's the distribution of the ice that creates torsion, or torque movements that sensors uh, can can um, turn the, the turbine off and fault. So the next issue that we saw, and these are issues that I saw in our real-time outage um, system, people entering outages, and these were the reasons. Um, gear lubricant, gelling, inducing a fault. So you have yaw motors, as much of you know, with wind turbines, they rotate the turbines. Um, and then you have, you know, a gear reduction or a gear, you know, basically a gear system in the middle to increase the speed of the turbine for the for the generator. And there's going to be lubricants and, and different you know, oils in there that can gel. Then the next we saw feeder faults. So what are feeder faults? Imagine if you lose one turbine on that fault on that feeder, you've now lost every every turbine on that feeder. Um, and that's what we we realized is a lot of the, the wind farms would call and say, we just lost feeder 10, we just lost feeder two. Um, we actually had a lot more difficult things to deal with than caring about individual wind farm feeders, but sometimes that's what they call about. Um, once the turbine's off, it'll stay off for quite a while. So that's hard, especially when you're in a winter storm with you know, a foot or two of snow and ice. The uh, workers cannot physically drive to the turbines. So that's one reason why they can't even clear the fault. Maybe it was a, it was a, a wrong fault through a sensor, but they can't even clear it. And it could be because um, if you're in forecasting, you know, the cup anemometers, the wind vanes, those instruments can freeze. And when they freeze, the turbine could have a safety system that says, when I don't know, when I'm blind as to how um, you know, fast the wind speed is, I'm turning off. So this is the icing forecast that we, re um, we received from our, our vendor. We were not showing any icing. You would expect that yellow line, the orange line to have different variations. Um, throughout, this is from the 13th to the 19th, so this is the entire week um, time span. The white line is actually what happened with the wind. Um, so we had a 5 gigawatt error just in the regular icing forecast, and it wasn't showing much icing. Now we know, talking to our operators, that we had a, a tremendous amount of icing, but we also had cold weather cutouts. <clears throat> So this is how we um, basically integrate our weather models into SPP. So we have eight here. We have another vendor and we have, I think, 10 there. Um, you can see that the weather models were kind of averaging between 15 to 17 and a half gigawatts starting on the 14th. And in reality, we only had 10 gigawatts show up. Now, the previous week we had a little bit of icing, but it wasn't, um, it wasn't that major. Now we know in real time when our when our weather model is is producing an output that it forecasts five gigawatts above where we're currently at. Typically, if it's not a quick drop, then we know that that is because of something that is hindering the system um, in real time. It's not a weather front that just moved through and oh, it's dropped by so many gigawatts in a certain time. 
I mean, this is, you know, if you can see my cursor, this is an entire seven to five gigawatt error for several hours. And then you see the same thing again, which is on uh, the 15th, 16th. Then you'll see on the 17th, the wind almost dropped to nothing. And that's really when SPP and both ERCOT were hurting the most. Um, you can see there was only a little bit of error there between all the models, but that's because the outages had then been put into the forecast. When you're having this large of an error, many times the wind farms don't even know why they're out yet, and they, I would say they refused, they delayed in putting their outages in. If we don't have an outage, we can't send it to our forecast vendor for them to then put in the forecast and um, send back to SPP. If they don't have an outage, they assume that that wind farm can um, you know, rotate as, as it says it can rotate. But in reality, we know that that wind farm cannot. But it just happens to be that the biggest challenge is getting wind farms. There are now over 230 wind farms in SPP, and we have over 15,000 wind turbines. And now we're at, um, I think our peak max is around 28 gigawatts now. So this was only about 60% of our, of our installed nameplate capacity that was forecasted, but in reality, only even around a third showed up. Solar challenges, so we don't have much solar in SPP. We have about 230 megawatts, but we have quite a bit of distributed solar, um, and I expect that's around four to 500 megawatts nowadays. So we have challenge of ice, um, snow that then melts and turns to ice, and if you see on the fixed axis, that that can slide off and then cover the panels for days. You know, once when snow melts and then re refreezes, it's hard as a brick, and that happens. On the single axis tracking, as you can imagine, which actually every wind farm, every solar farm that is in SPP and in the utility system, they're all single axis tracking. We don't have any fixed axis. There are some in the distribution system with fixed axis in SPP, but all the uh, utility are single axis. Well, how does a single axis rotate? Not only does it have complex snow loading that can wear out the, the rotating arms of the, of the solar farm or the bearing in the middle, um, a lot of times they'll fault because that motor that's right here or right here in between the panels cannot rotate because it's frozen or the solar panels have some, you know, you can imagine the weights on the left side. So how will that when those, those motors are not meant to just you know, break the system, so they'll just turn off. Let's say the sun rises now on the right side or the, the eastern side the next day. Well, the solar farm is going to miss, you know, an entire day of um, of melting or just even power production. You know, in series, um, a solar cell will not produce power if the previous one is blocked by bird poop or snow or a leaf. It doesn't matter. Um, <clears throat> icing on a single axis wind farm. We talked about okay, lo loss of rooftop solar. So. There's three, four, five hundred megawatts. We're not exactly sure how much rooftops in SPP, but we do know that when um, when when load is dropped, we also lose that uh, solar on the roofs. But we also lose it when it's covered in snow, and most homeowners are not that willing to go outside and scrape the snow off. Simply because if you start pushing snow off, you can have a foot of snow come piling into you and and bury you. So you have to be very careful. Nuclear challenges. So why I'm bringing up all different resources is that we had challenges and issues with every single resource. There was not one resource where we didn't have some kind of issue. With nuclear, it's a lot of the water intake. You have the cooling towers, you had water intake valves freezing, you had water intake pumps freezing, you had massive amounts of, of ice forming on different nuclear stations across the entire South. And it wasn't just SPP, it was also ERCOT and MISO. So cooling towers can freeze, the fans that blow the air in the cooling tower can freeze up and pipes froze. And you can imagine the amount of weight that the cooling tower uh, then basically contains because of additional ice. So we had some power plants that weren't nuclear, but there were other power plants that closed. It was a coal plant, at least one, that closed because of it's cooling tower becoming too heavy. I thought that was interesting because if you turn off all heat, then it seems like it would collect more ice. But um, that's what they did. The surrounding transmission system for nuclear is very important. So they are very, very, very careful about 
any voltage fluctuations. So you have to be very careful with nuclear power plants and then changing transmission system conditions. If you have transmission lines coming out near nuclear plants, you have to be very careful with stability around there. They don't want more than a percent or two of voltage fluctuations. A lot of power plants and transmission systems can withstand five to 10% voltage fluctuations for not nuclear. It's not designed for that. It's meant to trip. So you have to be very careful. You can see the ice building up on the bottom picture. It becomes unsafe when it starts to come over little loops, the louvers that, that allow the air into the cooling towers. We had even challenges with hydro. So there's differences between run of the river and lake dams. If you imagine run of the river, you have chunks of ice flowing down the river and they can get in the intake valves or just back up against the dam and put enormous pressure. There have been dams fail because of ice backups. But um, icing can get in the intake, but I want you to look at this smaller uh, image on the bottom. <clears throat> at different temperatures, you have different types of ice formation. If you have any ice that goes um, as a chunk down a uh, weir and then into the turbine, you will create pitting on that turbine. So a lot of hydro power plants, they have to basically turn off their system to prevent this from happening, or they have to have some mitigation. Then also imagine that you've now turned it off and you've allowed both the upstream and downstream to freeze. You can't just let the dam go because what you'll do is break the ice downstream and just push, push a massive ice barge down the river. So you have to be very careful with that. So that was another challenge that we face. We really, I mean, it gets cold in SPP, but a lot of times we don't have rivers freeze. Um, luckily, the further south you go, there are less rivers, but in the north, they are accustomed to this. Cold challenges. So I had one operator call from a power plant and said that our, their train bin was frozen. They couldn't even dump the coal out of the train because it had rained and it had melted a little bit, and then it had frozen the coal in the train. Um, conveyor belts froze, pulverizers um, froze up because of frozen chunks of coal that made it in and then basically damaged the pulverizers. So we had some calls with the power plants on that. And then it's the same as nuclear, cooling towers froze. And you can see on the image on the right, a little bit of the complexities of all that, the coal conveyor. So you're only as strong as your weakest point. And the more complex a power plant is, whether it's wind or solar or coal or it's in a, that's why it's called power plant. There's a bunch of processes going on. Anytime you break a link in that process, in that process, um, you have now have a new bottleneck and you might have two pulverizers, but when one goes down, um, you know, it puts you at more of a risk. And piping within power plants can freeze in the southern part of the of SPP. Um, especially in Louisiana and, and Texas, a lot of the power plants aren't even housed in buildings, right? Most of the year, 99% of the time, there's not even any cold weather to affect that power plant. So they don't even, you know, they're not built in, in buildings. Some of the power plants in the northern part of the United States and across the world even, they're built in enclosed facilities. The, the entire facility is enclosed. Every pipe, every exhaust valve, every Everything that could go wrong is within the building, and so it naturally stays warm. But that's not the same thing that happens in, uh, that's not the same you know, setup that's in southern coal plants and many power plants. Then we had natural gas problems. And you can imagine lack of winterization, there were heating jackets, um, there was a large switch to residential use in power, and gas has um, the right of way goes to residential instead of power plants, which is, is kind of interesting. Frozen wellheads, ice crews were slowed. The, the, the crews that were going to fix it were, were slowed. And pumping station equipment. You can imagine the pumping stations that you see in the bottom corner, a lot of those are electrically powered. So when you lose the power system, when you lose the electric system, you lose the midstream portion of the, of the, of the natural gas power system across the United States. And then diesel, which is funny, because a lot of the power plants have backup diesel plants. Um, they called and said, our diesel fuel is gelled. Well, the, the diesel you know, pumps rarely run, they're smaller, and you can just basically destroy the fuel filter and then you're done. That diesel plant's finished unless you change the fuel filter. But they're super, super, super important because a lot of times diesel units are how you start up power plants. You start up power plants either with diesel 
um, or some kind of fuel. And then you also have backup power for the power plants, hospitals, nursing homes, et cetera. But really there's a simple fix and you can go to Walmart and buy it. It's just called anti-gelling agent and you dump it in any of your diesel tanks. Depends on how big your diesel tank, how much you need, but there is a solution for this. So this should not have happened, but no one was expecting to use every single small diesel generator. So kind of coming more to a close, the generating capacity within SPP, this is a chart from the 1st of February all the way to you know the middle, um, middle half of February. So if you see in this um, yellow chart, that's the gas. The red dotted line is the emergency <clears throat> energy emergency alert. And that's where SPP entered into what are called EEAs. You have EEA 0, 1, 2, 3. And those are increasing levels of energy emergencies, basically, and what you're able to withstand, either your operating reserves or contingency reserves, or you're in, you're in load shed, and those EEAs increase until you're able to, I guess, basically brown out the system um, right before a blackout would happen. So that's the most emergency um, system operations you can be in. Um, so you can see that natural gas was really the culprit here. And this was the, these are SPP <coughs> charts. They're not ERCOT charts. If you remember, and you've seen presentations, ERCOT's kind of had the same problem. And so the wind right here in green was at around 10 gigawatts of, of um, generating capacity outages. This is the outage um, megawatts over here. And that was a lot caused by icing the previous week <clears throat> going into the week. When you have a cold air mass coming into a warmer air body from the Gulf of Mexico, it just, it just creates the perfect conditions for ice formation. So that's why SPP deals with quite a bit of ice um, that some areas of the world won't because you have a large body of water that's warm and you have a cold land mass um, that just mixes perfectly in the Midwest of the United States. Um, but then you can see that actually wind outages were less on the 14th to the 17th when it was more critical. Well, why was that? That was actually because there was just literally no wind there. And if there was any that was there, um, it was iced over or the turbine lubricant had gelled and they were out because of cold weather cutouts. If you see on the left though, those are our um, our nameplate capacity, only 42% of our available generation was available. Wind really was bad. It was 15% of nameplate. Gas was the next worst, but coal, I would, I don't say, I hate to say, but coal really got us to where we were today. I mean, we're at that, at that time, we wouldn't have made it if it weren't for the coal resources. 80% showed up, which is fantastic compared to the other generation resources. So, we can't always demonize coal. There's a role for coal in the future, I believe, especially gas, um, because with solar and wind, when you happen into these, these events, these aren't one or two day events. This thing dragged on for over a week across the entire footprint. Um, people are freezing in their homes, people are losing power. So we really have to, to implore that discussion. So finally, here's the last, last image, the second to last. Um, the generation outages climbed throughout the week, and then they hit a peak of around 35,000 megawatt, 35, megawatts of units that were not available due to some reason. And then here are the interruptions by entities. So we did pro rata load shedding. If you see on the 15th in the middle of the graph, we shed 600 megawatts. To the right on the 16th, we shed 1,359, and then we increased that to 70, um, 2,700 megawatts. Um, and this is between, this is in load ramps, 6, 7, 8, 9 a.m. That's when the system's really picking up. It's getting hot and heavy. People are waking up, you know, boiling coffee, making breakfast, and then it kind of dips off. But that's the only two times that we really shed load over any periods. And if you see WAPA is in the north part of SPP, they're 13% of the load shed. So they really had no problems up in the northern part of the footprint, but they shared in the load shed because we're a balancing authority. We're we're a liability controller of the whole footprint. We, sh we pro rata cut um, a load. So even though you may not be experiencing something, you may have your load cut, but it's, it's a way of sharing um, sort of the burden to prevent a blackout. That is the most important thing. Getting a blackout system back up and running takes days. Getting a controlled brownout back up and running takes minutes or hours. So that's the main point I want uh, to come give to you today. Anyways, thank you very much.
Thank, thank you, Gunnar. Great job and uh, a lot of a lot of information to absorb there. Um, there are some questions coming into Slido. I'd encourage folks to to enter questions and rank their questions. But now I'd like to get Craig set up, and I want to introduce Craig Collier. Craig is the chief meteorologist and head of operations at Energy Forecasting Solutions, a forecasting services firm based in California. Craig has spent 14 years in renewable energy forecasting and has been leading the EFS operation since January of 2020, serving wind and solar project owners, energy traders, and utilities. Craig received his MS in mathematics, his MS and PhD degrees in atmospheric science, and completed a postdoc in atmospheric science at the Scripps Institute of Oceanography. With that, I want to introduce Craig and look forward to your remarks. Yeah, thanks, Jay. Um, <clears throat> today, as uh, as potentially introduced, I, um, I'm going to be uh, talking a little bit about uh, the challenge of forecasting wind power um, during uh, the, the the February weather event in Texas, um, which was relatively unprecedented. Um, as you can imagine, uh, it, it, it was a, a difficult to do in real time uh, for unsurprising reasons. Uh, there was icing involved. Uh, for a number of wind projects, uh, there was uh, a sub-freezing air temperatures uh, to which all projects were exposed for an, an extended duration of time. Uh, the timing of which uh, on arrival and the duration of presence um, were <clears throat> uh, uh, there was some unknown uh, with uh, with regard to and also some uncertainty on. Um, <clears throat> there was also some sort of extremely cold air or an Arctic air mass, if you will, that uh, exposed a number of projects to temperatures that were below operational limits uh, for those for those particular projects. And uh, the timing of that, of the arrival of that air mass and its sort of duration of, of presence uh, over Texas uh, was another unknown and something else that it sort of needed to be forecast. So, so the key impact events, um, as I like to consider them, were you know the initial freezing uh, event, the sort of icing event that occurred for a number of projects in Texas prior to and it's sort of the start of the main event, um, the arrival of sub-freezing air that um, encompassed much of the state and the duration of its presence uh, throughout the state, uh, and uh, you know and 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 the duration of the exposure to the wind projects, uh, and then additionally the arrival of the sort of Arctic air mass that introduced a number of projects to air temperatures that. You know, went below um, uh, likely operating um, uh, limits. Uh, so, um, <clears throat> the, those three sort of meteorological events combined exposed projects to sort of deleterious, um, you know, uh, sort of effects uh, on production, both at this, you know, and that, that was sort of visible at the system wide scale, even and, and down to the project level as well. Uh, eliminating just sort of the challenge of Forecasting wind resource generally, um, you know, the 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 prediction of wind power during this kind of event is really a problem of predicting when there are going to be weather uh, weather induced outages um, and uh, where they're they're going to occur. So, um, <clears throat> with uh, respect to making an assessment of the overall environment for forecasting during the event, and in a way to sort of uh, forensically um, validate forecast methods. Uh, for for this event, uh, a, a number of data sets were sort of pulled together to compose, um, you know, the the the, uh, the composite uh, conditions uh, across Texas uh, during this this uh, multi-day event. Uh, so, uh, data from reanalysis, uh, so gridded gridded data sets, as well as uh, station-based data from the ASOS network and other networks within Texas were compiled together uh, to compose the meteorological conditions. Uh, in time and in space. Additionally, wind power data, uh, as um, uh, as as uh, procured from from ERCOT in the public domain, uh, for um, you know an assessment of how generation was affected, wind power generation was affected at the project level, uh, for um, given conditions to which projects were exposed. And additionally, project wind locate project locations were useful in terms of uh, at least down to the county level, knowing um, just. You know where uh, what projects were likely to be affected by uh, by incoming uh, weather conditions as forecasted and as 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 verified. The forecast is constructed from a number of sort of 
typical models that are used uh, in the wind industry for forecasting, including those from NOAA, the European Center, as well as Environment Canada. Uh, so these include global and regional scale models, some of which are deterministic and then have ensemble components to them. Um, and they all have distinctions with respect to how they predicted various elements of this event. And I won't have the time to sort of go into those distinctions uh, today. Um, <clears throat> but the problem of predicting you know, generation loss to this event is really dependent upon, you know, knowing um, how much, uh, you know, the, the potential generation uh, was there. And, and so being able to estimate potential generation um, and, and ultimately uh, subtract from that the actual generation uh, to, uh, to, to calculate the, the, the ultimate wind power loss from this event um, relied upon estimating that wind power potential and so that was done by you know making use of a weighted combination of reanalysis data some fixed tower measurement data and high resolution one kilometer model initial condition data to, to fill in some holes and so once that meteorological condition is composed at the plant level that's you know applied to uh theoretical power conversion models to generate the potential wind power that uh, that project would have been able to uh, to generate uh, without any limitations due to uh, icing or due to low temperature shutdown types of events. Um, and, uh, and so, you know, subtracting again, the, the sort of the generation schedules of the actual uh, as estimates of the actual conditions from the potential wind power allowed us to demonstrate or allowed us to calculate the, the, the equivalent losses. Um, those losses were filtered to just the event in question. So they were sort of event attributable losses, not losses due to other um, events that were not relevant. Um, so for example, are not least, at least not weather relevant. So those that uh, were potentially related to curtailment or other transmission limits or economic constraints. <clears throat> so um, I won't belabor too much any pre you know, previous discussion on the origins of this event and sort of some of the long range uh, predictability of it. I mean, suffice to say that in sort of midwinter, we had a fairly uh, ampl you know, highly amplified sort of semi hemispheric weather pattern um, over the northern uh, hemisphere uh, and, and particularly over North America and uh, with some amplification of pressures and, and, a, and a ridge building over over Greenland. Uh, significant warming um, and significant sea level pressures, uh, significant sea level pressure anomalies at the highest latitudes likely contributed in, in some part to the sudden stratospheric warming that occurred and um, ultimately uh, allowed for the expulsion of a lot of you know, Arctic air uh, into middle and lower latitudes in February, sort of carried by an expressway, if you will, of, of a, of a mid-latitude jet that was pushed well to the north. That Ultimately, that event, you know, yielded some of the coldest temperatures, you know, observed uh, on record and certainly within the last 100 years for a number of locations, not just in Texas, but further north and well into the uh, Canadian provinces. Um, and that was demonstrated just with, you know, a look back at, um, at, at, an, at sort of the anomalies relative to climatology over the last, uh, over the last 40 years. Now, it's useful to sort of measure uh, the evolution of the frigid air mass that was in place um, by looking at contour maps of surface conditions relative to wind project locations in Texas. And so that's presented here in these maps. And you can see that um, what, what's called cold air advection, sort of the, the push of, of cold air into the state uh, by um, sort of the storm level winds um, proceeds through about the first eight days of this, of this event. Early on, early in the event of the ninth, we've got a number of projects in the northern part of the state that are likely experiencing uh, below freezing conditions. Um, and that freezing line continues to push south uh, through the state, effectively, you know, keeping the entire state in sub-freezing conditions by at least the 13th and certainly on to, into the 14th. Uh, into the 14th, another significant event occurs, which uh, I'll talk about in a bit, which is the arrival of an Arctic air mass that effectively uh, introduces a number of projects to temperatures that are below, you know, minus 10 degrees C and some, in some cases approaching low temperature limits for a number of these projects. Um, and estimating sort of the wind power generation conditions for these projects individually um, was, was done by sort of a, uh, combining um, surface based measurements uh, in, in and around those pro or around the projects and combining with combining that with reanalysis uh, data uh, where there were holes. 
to, to estimate what were the likely weather conditions uh, affecting operations at these projects over time. And so that's you know, mapped here every six hours in the next uh, couple of slides to show that, you know, uh, you know, in these maps here, beginning on the 10th, um, projects sort of north of the freezing line were likely experiencing some icing, uh, either due to freezing rain, freezing fog, freezing drizzle um, of, some, of some form. Uh, that freezing line continues to push south, it, you know, advancing towards the Gulf of Mexico and projects that were iced uh, over the next 48 to 72 hours continue ex to experience iced conditions. So they're not necessarily experiencing more of the sort of originating events, but they're color coded here as, as being iced up due to the, the initial event, which may have been freezing rain and, and which sort of that, that icing, which persists through, through the next few days. As we um, you know, move into uh, sort of the, the, the 12th and the 13th, the, the cold air, the sub-freezing air, it continues to sort of advance south into, uh, into Texas. And again, by the, uh, the 14th, uh, we have another sort of pivotal or key impact event that occurs uh, beyond the initial sort of freezing or uh, sort of icing event um, early in the event, uh, which is the arrival of this Arctic air, which plunges a number of projects uh, into in, in, to to air which you know which uh, is, is characterized by temperatures you know well below minus ten degrees C, and in some cases reaching the uh, cold temperatures cut uh, shutout limits for our shutdown limits for these projects. Um, and even when the temperatures are allowed to or, or actually go above the temper the, that the cutout limit, there's a number of projects that uh, are still iced up, so they never really get a chance to recover. Um, either from the icing, even after the uh, the, the temperatures warm slightly above cut uh, uh, shutdown limits, there is some warming that occurs across parts of the state on the 15th and 16th. Um, that allows you know projects say north uh, south of about 30 degrees uh, latitude to to thaw, um, but you know there's a sort of a reinforcing or a secondary shot of um, of cold air that uh, that. Uh, advances south into Texas on the 18th and 19th, and a number of projects in the northern part of the state that were iced up just simply are not getting the opportunity to, to thaw, to have any of that ice melt in this sort of secondary freeze, and it just prolongs the shutdown period um, for, for a number of these projects. <clears throat> At the zonal level, it's use, useful to consider kind of the, the regions of Texas that were likely impacted by some of these key impact events, either the, the, uh, the icing, uh, the low temperature shutdowns, uh, for example. Low temperature shutdowns in particular um, likely affected projects mo mostly in the Panhandle, mostly in western parts of Texas, as well as in the north zone of Texas. Um, icing affected projects, likely affected projects in all of the zones of Texas from the Panhandle all the way down to the coast, uh, which I think uh, is, is certainly uh, noteworthy. Uh, for this particular event. It's also uh, of interest to sort of consider the diversity of impacts within the regions. And um, that's depicted here in this time series, which sort of shades the range of impacts across the region uh, as expected at these projects against uh, sort of local temperature observations. So you can see there's, you know, impacts on, on generation or generation losses that are high and increase when temperatures uh, you know, sink below freezing and certainly well below freezing, but the range, the shading is really what, uh, what's important here. That there's so much diversity of the impacts within relatively small regions. Um, one exception would be the north zone, which is a, a fairly small region geographically and has uh, I, I, a small number of projects relative to the other projects uh, in, in Texas. That particular zone uh, experiences a relatively smaller range of of, of, uh, of impacts on, on generation and, and certainly um, effects on generation loss than the other regions. Um, but certainly the diversity within the other regions is concerning. It's sort of a red flag in terms of the predictability of this event um, at, at a sort of granular level. So it's one thing to be able to estimate the generation loss at a particular site. The, the real challenge is being able to, even if we could do that in a, in a precise way, the real, the real challenge is being able to sort of predict it and in several days out to sort of the next day and sort of operational timescales. Again, that really relies on the model's um, fidelity or quality with respect to forecasting um, icing, with respect to um, forecasting the arrival of sub-freezing and duration, uh, sub-freezing air and the duration of that air mass. 
uh, in, in terms of its presence, as well as the arrival of the extremely low temperature air that introduces uh, projects to, to uh, temperatures that could uh, invoke shutdowns. Icing was unfortunately not as well predicted as I would have uh, hoped for this particular event for the start of the event, at least in the models that, that we reviewed in real time. Um, particularly in the three to two day ahead time frame, there was not very good model consensus on where the icing was going to occur. Um, day ahead, models came into a lot better convergence on where that icing would occur, uh, which was useful, um, but it certainly um, was, uh, you know, a, a lot more uncertain 72 to 48 hours out. In terms of the first 24 hour freeze, which I consider sort of a pivotal milestone in terms of the initiation of the long range event, um, you know, this was a, a this would have been a 24 hour period in which um, there would have been no opportunity for for thawing of ice or melting of ice at these projects. And so it, it was uh, a day or sort of a period that was important to to predict and predict in terms of timing. And, um, you know, unfortunately, the three to two day ahead time frames, um, that full freeze day was not very well predicted, at least there wasn't a lot of consensus in terms of when that would occur for a number of projects. Um, in, uh, in, in that were affected by the full freeze, which is almost all of them um, uh, in, in Texas. It wasn't until day ahead when there was a larger consensus, greater than 50% of, of the model solutions evaluated were starting to converge upon, you know, a, a day in which we would have a full 24 hours of, of a freeze uh, to sort of kick off this, this event. <clears throat> the, um, the length of the freeze was was extremely important because that had bearing on when ice would thaw and um, unfortunately predicting that initial thaw day was challenging even in the day prior um, which i think bared um, into uh, the overall predictability of, of when generation loss during this event and reaching the low temperature shutdown which is another key sort of impact event um, was somewhat better predicted uh, at least in the day at least in in the days prior to to when that Arctic air mass would arrive uh, at 72 and 48 hours ahead. We we did have models indicating there were, that you know there was possibility or risk of reaching low temperature limits for these projects, but it wasn't until the day ahead when we had a, a really strong convergence of models on that on that particular outcome. The duration of that extremely cold air, the the presence of that cold air, and the duration potential duration of those um, cold weather related shutdowns. Uh, was somewhat better predicted than certainly the sub-freezing air mass and its duration, only because this was a shorter duration event in the grand scheme of them. Um, it lasted only about one to three days uh, for a number of projects by our, our estimations. Um, and so the models, at least in the day ahead, certainly did a, a better job sort of being able to forecast that we, you know, that, that certain projects were going to emerge from that, uh, that extreme low temperature condition. So we take all of this, this model guidance and there's a couple of different ways we can approach it in terms of the, the forecasting of generation loss. Um, we can, in sort of a decision support system, you know, consider that when there's icing, we want to interrogate the models to determine when there's going to be a thaw. And, um, you know, the higher percentage of models that uh, sort of, you know, are, are predicting a thaw at a given time sort of makes for a relatively conservative forecast in terms of when, you know, generation losses are going to, to decrease or when we will return to generation for certain projects. The lower number of models that we rely upon for determining that thaw obviously uh, create a more aggressive forecast with respect to change and respect to changes in the generation. Equally, we can also apply the same interrogation of models for, a, for a, you know, a rainfall scenario in which we have rain occurring or liquid precipitation occurring at these projects? When is there going to be a freeze? If is there going to be a freeze? How do the models sort of project that um, proportionately uh, before we have the low temperature limit? And so you know, taking the model guidance, the ensemble model guidance, and then trying to apply it in a proportionate way to make brute force adjustments to the power forecast, the potential forecast worked in some scenarios for this particular event and for particular projects affected a couple of, pro of, of days shown here for a couple of anonymous projects showing that you know, towards the tail end, end, end of the event, some, um, some inclement uh, weather uh, was captured by the models and, and ultimately allowed us to uh, reduce the forecast for generation output accordingly to improve it um, relative to what the potential would have shown. 
But the other way to, of course, apply this model data, this ensemble model data is in sort of a windowing approach. In other words, issuing forecasts that uh, for the potential, the wind power potential that um, are accompanied by a, a, a windowing of, uh, of risk. And so um, the risk either in this case would have been due to icing risk for a project in a particular day or low temperature shutdown risk, you know, characterized here in green and blue colors respectively. So the shading of that of that sort of window darkens for the larger number of models or the the, lar the, the greater confidence we have in that event um, and uh, and the the sort of bounds of it help to uh, describe sort of the, the the duration of that event if you will and so um, you know with the benefit of hindsight we can measure how well forecast the potential at a variety of anonymous projects here over a, a number of days throughout the event um, can you know compare to to actual generation, and and, and visualize where these windows, uh, when issued as part of a, a as part of a forecast delivery, uh, had had real value. So they were timed well with where there was significant deviations in in the generation due to uh, due to uh, weather related losses. There are false positives, and um, those are inherent with either approach here. And so uh, we did see them with the windowing approach, um, and uh, and you know where we were forecasting particular events that did not occur. And certainly there were false negatives as well, though not as many. And those are potentially more costly because ultimately we're we're not predicting an event that did occur. For example, icing and an associated large loss with that. In comparison with the two approaches, um, the direct adjustment approach. Um, was not comprehensively successful. So there were a number of projects for which we just didn't achieve a better forecast by making those brute force adjustments uh, at sort of, you know, that's say improving uh, the prediction of the generation uh, associated with it. Um, the, uh, the windowing approach allowed for a slightly better result. Uh, we were able to window about, you know, up to 70% of the losses uh, in, the, in, the, in the day ahead and two day ahead timeframes. Um, with on average for most of the projects uh, capturing about or windowing about 50% of those losses. So in the day in the in the day ahead and, and two day ahead timeframes, there were false positives and those rates 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 are important to note. Uh, they were up to about 16% of total generation over the period uh, for uh, for for the projects. That's the extreme end. On the average in the day ahead, it was about 5% uh, of total generation that was uh, sort of false positively indicated as being as being lost. Uh, so, in conclusion, um, you know, this was uh, certainly a difficult event to, to forecast um, in real time. Uh, it sort of continually defied expectations uh, with respect to what the models were predicting, uh, particularly with regards to the duration of the sub-freezing um, event and our sort of the, the, the sub-freezing air mass that uh, to which these projects were exposed. Um, icing uh, was uh, not well predicted uh, several days ahead, which would have been helpful, but it was better predicted in the day in the 24-hour time frame. Uh, which certainly um, helped the forecast overall. Um, a comparison of the two techniques for application of the ensemble NWP indicates that they were both about equally successful in terms of it's sort of you know improving forecast uh, performance, particularly for generation or, gener or the loss of generation. But the window windowing sort of method, I think, conveys a lot more important detail, particularly with regards to um, confidence in, in events occurring and um, and the timeframes at which they occur. Uh, without providing a direct application to the uh, to the to the power forecast itself. That's it. Thank you. Thanks, thanks, Craig. That was great, and uh, appreciate you sharing all that information. Uh, I, I learned a lot there, and uh, people are throwing some questions in the Slido, and I'd encourage folks to go in there and vote, and and even add your own. But now it's a pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Alina Spiro from NREL. And she's a research engineer in the Power Systems Engineering Center at the National Re Renewable Energy Lab or NREL. At NREL, Al Alina focuses on wholesale market design, power system operations, and integration of variable, hybrid, and distributed energy resources. Alina holds a PhD in power system planning under uncertainty from the Johns Hopkins University. With that, I'd like to introduce Alina and look forward to your presentation. Thank you, Jay. Good afternoon. Can you hear me correctly? Awesome. You're good. 
Uh, good afternoon. Uh, so this talk is in between. Uh, we basically are studying wind offering in regulation market. And we have as an input forecasts, like the ones we saw in the second talk. And then uh, we basically advise on offering, which affects the award that then affect the real time operations, which was the topic of the first talk. Um, so diving in, uh, why are we talking about wind offering in regulation markets today? Because we anticipate that in the future, wind and solar photovoltaics will play a major role in the future electricity resource mix. Um, there is a projection by IA, almost 70% of the electricity will, will be generated by 2050 by these resources. And these resources are variable energy resources, so they're inherently different compared uh, to resources we might have been used to operating in the past. So, um, in terms of the grid, um, why we're talking today about the regulating reserves, uh, because it is one of the products that expresses the grid needs. Uh, we have here a list of all the products that are being traded in organized electricity markets, uh, all the way from energy and capacity to ancillary services. And um, wind and solar have been offering energy and firm capacity with the ELCC calculations for a while, and ancillary services are another uh, category of products, and they help manage the uncertainty and the variability of the electricity supply and demand. And so far, we have seen only a handful of variable energy resources providing ancillary services. So the question we ask as we look into a future grid with uh, higher penetration is how could variable energy resources, and in our case, wind, supply ancillary services? And if variable energy resources are about to supply ancillary services, they should also manage their own uncertainty and variability in order to help uh, manage the system-wide uncertainty and variability. So the, this is the overarching question we ask, but for the first year of our project, we scoped it down to one type of ancillary service, regulating reserves, because it is the highest in the pricing hierarchy, and we have demonstrated control capabilities in the past through pilots. And we also focus on the uncertainty management part, which affects most of the offering. Um, the variability management part comes into play a lot in the control uh, operations of the plan. And uh, there are different solutions we could have to manage the uncertainty. Uh, but here we discuss how we could use probabilistic forecasts or otherwise called interval forecasts because we don't have to add uh, a storage device to hybridize the resource and we, we don't have to enter new contractual agreements, for example, in case we want clusters of renewable resources to provide uh, regulating reserves. So the question we ask is, considering the available probabilistic forecasts, what quantity can be offered as regulation capacity by variable energy resources and at what price? And uh, to do that, uh, we, we first want to learn the rules of the game uh, we want to play. We want to learn the operator's rules uh, that are relevant for uh, delivery. And we found that uh, most operators have disqualification rules that determine what constitutes acceptable performance. And basically, these uh, disqualification rules have two types of metric. Type 1 metric expects a lower bound in terms of the frequency of intervals with acceptable performance. And type 2 metric expects a lower bound with respect to average precision. Moreover, uh, operators encourage near perfect delivery of regulation capacity by adjusting the payment that the resource receives for providing regulation capacity. So in our review, uh, we found four different settlement schemes. Uh, the prorata, which adjusts the payment uh, proportional to the performance score, a, a kind of all or nothing scheme in quote and quotes, uh, where the payments are rescinded if the performance is below a threshold, a, a hybrid scheme that combines the prorata and the all for nothing, and then uh, finally, we saw that there is uh, a scheme where the resources providing regulation reserves incur over and under generation balance, uh, penalties similar to resources providing just energy, but with a stricter tolerance. So now that we know the rules, 
uh, we revisit again our question and we we are finally ready to answer it. Um, what quantity can be offered as regulation capacity and at what price? So here are the answers and then I will explain how we got to these answers. So basically the first answer with respect to quantity is that variable energy resources that consider operators disqualification rules should offer lower than the median percentile of their forecast as regulation capacity. With respect to the second question, with respect to the price, um, we see that when settlement schemes encourage near perfect delivery by adjusting payments for imperfect delivery of regulation capacity, opportunity costs should reflect the expected performance or Otherwise, if the opportunity costs don't reflect the expected performance, the resources might have to offer even lower percentiles than the ones implied by the disqualification rules. So let's make sure we're on the same page about uh, the probabilistic forecast. Um, we are all used to seeing the orange line here from this graph, which is the median or the mean of the day ahead forecast. But we can uh, basically have uh, different methods, either ensemble forecasting or quantile regression, in order to create uh, forecasts at different percentiles, different intervals. Um, so here, for example, if you go to R2, you can see that the very bottom line is the fifth percentile. Uh, basically, the fifth percentile says that 95% of the time, I expect uh, this wind resource to provide more energy than the fifth percentile and 5% of the time I expect the wind resource to generate less electricity than uh, the percentile. And then um, basically we argue that the probabilistic forecasts are useful for deciding on regulation offers and um, here on the left hand side we say that the disqualification rules having a lower bound for performance they suggest an upper bound on the offer of regulation capacity and this upper bound is a rule dependent percentile of the true probabilistic forecast uh, let me walk you through a simple example where we saw this correspondence between the lower bounds on the performance metrics coming from the disqualification rules to upper bounds for offers of regulation capacity. So here we have a wind plan. Uh, they offer as regulation capacity the 15th percentile. Um, the system operator clears the market and they have the awards. So the award can be lower or equal to the capacity that was offered. Um, in the upper branch, the award is equal to the regulation capacity. In the lower branch, the award is lower than the regulation capacity. We ignore the lower branch for now because um, it's less severe case compared to the upper branch. So following the upper branch, uh, we have this random node um, to reflect the uncertainty with respect to the generation. And if we have offered the 15th percentile and we have a a perfect probabilistic forecast, 85% of the time we would be long. So we would have more electricity um, available to generate. And if we can control our curtailments to the desired level, our performance with respect to delivery of regulation capacity would be perfect. So we'd have a, an acceptable performance, even 100% score. Uh, but 15% of the time we would be short. So our performance could be unacceptable if it's below a tolerance. Um, here, let's be very conservative, assume we don't have a tolerance and um, the less than 100% is equal to zero. So under these conservative assumptions, we see that an offering of the 15th percentile would, be, would yield at least 85% of the intervals with acceptable performance according to type one metric and at least 85% average precision score according to type 2 metric. So this is uh, the, the basic idea that we can take these disqualification rules and any rules that the system operator provides to us and then um, use a probabilistic forecast, use the knowledge we have for the uncertainty of the resource in order to make an offer that will comply with these rules. Uh, however, I already said that this example is simple and one, um, one major reason that this example is simple is this random node. Um, it had an assumption that basically in this random node uh, we can have an infinite number of independent rows. 
Um, in practice, we will have a finite number of probably autocorrelated draws in the assessment period. Um, so the, the situation in reality is um, a bit more complicated than the simple example we saw earlier. So for that, um, here we have more of a visual how the offering of regulation capacity will be at a percentile lower than the median. If we have this 85% target performance, you can see with this arrow A uh, that the capacity we offer as a regulation is uh, by A lower compared to the median. Then if we consider uh, that we have a finite assessment period, here I took an example of 30 days, uh, we reduce even further the capacity we offer. So you can see the difference uh, in B. And then if we want to account for autocorrelation of forecast errors, uh, basically accounting that the draws we have will not be independent, um, here we have a heuristic to account for it. We reduce even further our offer by ROC. Um, so you can see so far uh, what are our conclusions and uh, we have analytical derivations uh, for this offering of the quantity of regulation capacity from variable resources. Now we move into the price issue and in the price issue we have a major dilemma if the wind plant will offer energy or if they will offer regulation, assuming they will be dispatched up to their upper operating limit. And when they offer energy, they get the profit from energy. When they offer regulation, they get the price for regulation minus the cost uh, for regulation and the capacity offer they've made. Um, this problem is well known. It's already being taken care of being taken care of in the markets uh, because opportunity costs are being considered to make the resource indifferent between energy and regulation. So when uh, the resource uh, has a trade-off, the price for regulation would be equal to the profit from energy plus the cost for regulation. Uh, when we look though at a near certain supplier, then the dilemma becomes a bit more complicated because there is the possibility of being short uh, with respect to the regulation capacity we offer, the wind plant offer, and then we would have adjustment to the payments for regulation capacity to account for this imperfect delivery. So in this case, um, again, um, there's a lot of um, analytical uh, calculations to come up with the formulas we present in this slide we see that the price that would make the resource, the price of regulation that would make the resource indifferent between offering energy and regulation is higher than before. Because if you look at the first bullet point, now the profit from energy is divided by an alpha, we, which this alpha is lower or equal to one reflecting expected performance. So this is a higher uh, regulation price compared to the one we saw earlier when the delivery is perfect. Um, this first bullet point applies for the settlement schemes one to three we saw earlier for the pro rata proportional adjustment of the revenue, the all or nothing and the hybrid scheme. And then for the fourth scheme where we saw a different tolerance for the over and under generation penalties uh, between energy and energy plus regulating resources, uh, again, the price is higher, but now we see a, an additive term, which depends on this epsilon, where epsilon reflects the difference in the tolerance. So um, the resource basically has three options. Um, either the operator already considers this um, opportunity cost, this higher price that would be required because of imperfect delivery, um, I think one operator considers as alpha the average historical performance. Um, the other option the plant would have would be to try to calculate the opportunity cost themselves when they make an offering. Um, this is not straightforward. It needs uh, forecasting of prices, which is a, a notoriously difficult task. Or the other option is to offer capacity at a level that we know we can deliver almost perfectly all the time. So this could be the first percentile. Um, I'm showing it here that uh, we would reduce even further from um, 
the seventh percentile we had before for autocorrelations, we follow ROD and we go all the way to the first percentile. Um, the first percentile is at the tail of the distribution, so it's always difficult to predict. With that, uh, I want to summarize our two key findings are first that the variable energy resources can consider operators disqualifications rule and offer lower than the median percentiles of their forecast as regulation capacity and be able to meet uh, these uh, performance metrics, these performance targets set by the operator over an assessment period. The second finding is that when the settlement schemes encourage near perfect delivery of capacity, opportunity costs should reflect expected performance or resources might have an incentive to, to offer even lower percentiles compared to the ones derived based on disqualification rules. Um, one thing I want to highlight is you can see how important the probabilistic forecast is and uh, for, for both these findings. So we need a good probabilistic forecast. In terms of future research, research we want to study alternative participation schemes um, by hybridizing the resource or having clusters of variable energy resources. Um, we might have to consider the control performance and imperfection in forecasting system to decide on offering. Um, some of the conservative assumptions we followed so far can possibly be relaxed. And um, finally, we would offer recommendations for product design uh, by also studying the correlation of regulation deployment with uh, availability of variable generation. Um, and I want to mention that this work has been completed under a three-year project uh, integrating atmosphere to electrons to grid research and tools to increase the value streams of wind power plants. And um, in this project, we have an interdisciplinary team uh, looking at probabilistic forecasting of atmospheric conditions and wind power, control algorithms, and decision analysis for offering of ancillary services. And the last topic is the one I discussed today. Uh, our plan is to release case studies and uh, the software platform we are developing. So with our case studies, we will assess the profitability and reliability of individual wind power plant offering uh, ancillary services and the open source tool will integrate the forecasting, the control and the decision analysis capabilities to advise on offers for energy and ancillary services, but also implement controls to deliver contracted energy and ancillary services in real time. And with that, um, I want to thank, uh, we have an interdisciplinary team, uh, the at 2 g team. Um, you can see we have uh, atmospheric scientists, control engineers, decision analysts, and we are very excited uh, to discuss more with you, the project, and answer any questions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Alina, and very informative, and I'm sure we're going to get more questions. Um, we've got about 15 minutes or so, and we've got several questions. I'd, I'd like to start um, with, with Gunnar, and it's related to how the performance was in SPP relative to ERCOT. So was SPP less affected than ERCOT in general? And more specifically, why, why did the SPP coal plants fare so much better than the ERCOT coal plants? So Gunnar, can you turn on your video and Craig too and answer the question? You know, Gunnar's an operations engineer. It wouldn't be surprising to me that he got called off to solve a real problem. <laughs> Hopefully he'll be back. Um, let's go on to, to Craig, okay, while we're waiting on Gunnar. Um, Craig, um, here's a question for you. What model improvements are required to do a better job the next time around? Yeah, that <laughs> that's a good question. Uh, yes, yeah, certainly. Um, in, in due to the reliance of individual models on um, this this particular study, it's it's kind of a hard um, one to suss out um, from what we've seen. But um, you know, some of the key um, factors that I think um, made the forecasting challenge, uh, you know, worthy of its name, uh, a challenge was just the um, the lack of predictability of some of the icing at a very granular level uh, within uh, within the region. 
um, certainly more than a day ahead. And even in the day ahead, um, uh, there were a number of projects for which uh, icing would not have been predicted. And that's uh, um, certainly um, one of the most difficult components, uh, you know, to predict from from a numerical weather prediction model, um, in, in the sense that it's highly parameterized in many cases, and um, that relies on a level of empiricism that um, uh, that has a, you know a high amount of uncertainty in it. Um, otherwise, you know the um, uh, I think the duration of the, the freeze itself, um, certainly when the, the temperatures were going to warm, um, was, um, was one area of weakness that um, the, the models uh, I, I, I observed um, had. And I think potentially that could have been improved, or maybe that is an area of improvement um, for, uh, for the weather prediction models. It may come down to some feedback from the surface and, and snow cover that had some impact there um, that uh, kind of persisted a cold uh, cold air at the, in, in the lowest levels of the atmosphere. Um, but otherwise, you know, some of the arrival of uh, the timing of some of the air masses um, and, and, you know, uh, it was was fairly good amongst the models and there was a fairly good consensus among timing of sort of temp large temperature changes, uh, which, um, uh, which I think did help the forecast, but otherwise the sort of the the struggle with sort of the persistence of that of that air mass, um, and and again the 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 icing uh, and the granularity of that prediction on on the front end at the at the, at the start of the event. Thanks, Craig. That, that's very helpful. Hey, looks like Gunner's back. We missed you. Can you unmute Gunner? You're double muted again. We get you back. We'll ask you a question. If not, I'm going to work out. Move over to Alina. Gunner, you're still muted. Alina, while well, waiting on Gunner, let's let's ask a question for you. Um, so the comment was the metrics sound very stringent for the regulation bids. Can you explain why they were so stringent? Yeah. Uh so basically, regulating reserves um, are being procured in order to manage the variability of uh, system level electricity supply and demand. Um, so we deploy regulating reserves past the, the last five minute market or any five minute scheduling uh, an operator has. And it is very important for the resources that provide regulating reserves to be able to respond uh, to the instructions that the power system operator sends. Um, so that's, that's why uh, regulating reserves might seem uh, uh, having more stringent uh, performance metrics with respect to energy. Um, on one hand, though, I want to say, for example, uh, we saw the case of AirCode, where um, we have the same metric. We have uh, a base point signal being received by energy resources and base point signal being received by energy plus regulating reserves. Um, and the, the only difference is the tolerance there uh, because of the nature of the regulating reserve product um, and the assumption on the ramp rate of the resource. Um, so fundamentally, after the, the five minute market, all resources that have some sort of award energy on regulation are expected to perform. And then um, for regulating reserves, we might have some additional metrics or some stricter tolerances to make sure that the reliability of the grid is being maintained. That makes sense. Thank you. Gunnar, are you back? Can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? I can. Perfect. Yeah, I, I can. I have no clue what happened, but uh, I lost the internet. <laughs> then, I, then I called in and then it didn't work. And then, so anyways, yeah, I was looking here. at the... Questions room. Did, did you hear the question about the differences between the effects in SPP and ERCOT and in general and more specifically the performance of the coal units in SPP were superior to those in, in ERCOT? Yeah. So just in, in general, <clears throat> I wouldn't say it's any state or regulatory processes or any national or FERC or NERC. Um it's it's mostly to do with just SPP is is more accustomed to colder weather. We're not especially accustomed to having minus, you know, 
and you know, negative temperatures across the entire footprint. Um, really, one of the issues that kind of pushed us over the edge was the exports to ERCOT. We were exporting quite a lot. And then, um, you know, the MISO seam border was also cold. Um, MISO had, you know, MISO's footprint goes way over to the east. So they weren't quite as affected as we were, but we were able to lean on MISO quite a bit. Um, but we were still exporting to, to ERCOT and SPP was still um, negative in the entire footprint. Um, so that's that's one of the reasons why. We were able to um, import between three to five gigawatts at most times. So that's quite a lot. So we were very thankful for that. Um, in terms of the coal plants, I saw that question somewhere. Um, so the coal plants in SPP, a lot of them are insulated better and they're in buildings. Um, it depends on how far south you go. The insulation becomes less. Less coal plants are actually in fully encapsulated buildings. They have you know wet coal storage and then dry coal storage and how many, you know, how many tons of coal can they store in, in different storage units or domes? Some of them have. Um, <clears throat> some of them are closer to the mine and they have little you know, conveyor belts from the mine to the coal plant. So there are a lot of different things that change that, but most of it's just winterization. Um, ERCOT's just, they just don't see these these temperatures, especially all the way down to Houston. So it's really something, I don't know, I mean, how do you plan for a 100 year event? It would be very, very, very costly to, you know, just plan for any 100 or 500 year event. So that's just kind of the way the, the chips fell. Um, okay. Not that SPP in Thanks, particular Gunner. is so much better. Yeah. Okay, thank you. That helps. So and while I got you, before I lose you again, I'm gonna ask you another question. Okay, okay. Um, one of the questions was uh, to, directed to Gunner. Did you receive any wind farm outage schedules in advance that were due to accurate cold weather cutout forecasts? Can you comment on that? Yeah. Hi, Jeff. I saw your question. That was a good one. Um, so we do not receive. Oh, no, I think we lost Gunner again. We tried. Internet challenges. Let, let me move back to, uh, to Craig and. Um, Craig, here's a question for you. Um, ha have you seen winter storm early types of weather in any future climate scenarios? What probability should we give to URI in a probabilistic study? Is it 1 in 100 years? Yeah, that's uh, <clears throat> that's a good question. Um, and yeah, the short answer is uh, is no. I haven't uh, seen that in the study, uh, at least not recently. Um, you know, I think uh, that um, it's an event that, at least by you know from from the records that that I've evaluated, is probably more of a two in a lifetime kind of kind of event. Um, so maybe two in a hundred years, um, just historically, but. Um, exactly how um, changes in the climate you know, potentially um, increase the frequency of these kinds of events is, is an open question. And certainly um, the the um, potential catalysts for polar vortex weakening that ultimately contributed to, to or was the primary cause of the event in Texas uh, that I evaluated, um, to the extent those, those kinds of catalysts um, become more frequently observed, more intense um, in the winter, um, I think that, you know, we could be looking at a higher probability than say two and a hundred in terms of, of, of a sort of return rate on this kind of event. Thanks, Craig. That's very helpful. Um, Elena, Elena um, here's a question for you. What lessons are learned by study and regulating reserves that we can transfer to other services and sister op system operations in general? I think that's a question we are interested to as well uh, as we start starting regulating reserves. And basically what we learn is that once we have a, a specific rule and uh, we are 
aiming to operate the resource according to this rule. We can leverage all the information we have, uh, for example, coming from probabilistic forecast, in order to meet what the, the need, uh, what the grid needs. Uh, of course, if we have rules uh, that expect a variable resource to perform during an unannounced test, uh, the the performance and uh, the interpretation, the probabilistic interpretation of rules becomes much more difficult. Um, so I think lesson one uh, we learned is that we can interpret even existing rules in the probabilistic ways. Uh, we can leverage the probabilistic forecast and uh, this uh, value, this also speaks to the value of the probabilistic forecast and research and effort we can put into improving the probabilistic forecast. But then uh, a larger question also emerges when operators set these rules, uh, did they have in mind that variable resources might interpret them in a probabilistic ways? And uh, when we are sizing the requirements for the reserves, um, have we accounted for correlations in terms of the response uh, between resources? Uh, um, where this like 15% I was talking about, how we can justify it? Uh, is it only for normal operations? Will we have extreme events? Do we want to dynamically adjust? Um, so there are a lot of interesting questions uh, that uh, we have to answer in order to uh, imagine this um, market and uh, power system operations in the future where we have resources that can quantify their uncertainty and they can communicate this uncertainty to the operators. Very good, Elena, thank you. Sounds like you have job security for you and other researchers at NREL in this area. So good luck with that. Um, I'm going to give a, a one more question to, to Craig and then one more to Elena and we'll see if Gunnar shows back up. But Craig, how does the knowledge of real time plant operations help the day ahead and two day ahead forecast during such a extreme weather events? Yeah, well, well certainly having that that knowledge um, allows us to persist certain conditions that we wouldn't have otherwise known existed. Um, so if, if there has been icing shutdown, or a cold temperature shutdown um, that's been called for a particular project or an operator's called in. Um, <clears throat> having that just be able to persist forward into the forecast, you know, in, in an event like the one we had in February, it might go out a day or two as opposed to just a few hours um, would have would have certainly helped. Um, it doesn't really have much bearing on how, you know, the individual numeric weather prediction models um, behave and what they predict, um, having not sort of not privy to that feedback, but but certainly as as a forecaster, um, being privy to it is 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 very can be very useful. Um, and in this study, it, we were sort of blind to that kind of information. Um, it was really more of an evaluation or an appraisal of just you know how the the calibrated models performed um, individually and 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 the value that they had and working together as an ensemble for sort of decision support. Um, but, uh, yeah, it, it, it's, um, for an event like this, that, that kind of information certainly would have been, would have been very helpful. Yeah, makes sense. Thank you. And one last question for Alina. Um, well, how would you think about extending your analysis to wind that is paired with storage in the form of either pumped hydro or battery or whatever storage resource? You have some comments on that? That's, that's a great question. And. We are actively thinking about this because um, storage, uh, we have already seen that storage can provide uh, regulating reserves. I think that's the major source of uh, income for um, storage resources that participate currently, for example, in California ISO. Um, so the, the regulating reserve seems to be a, a product fitting uh, storage because they have very um, shallow uh, charging and discharging, not uh, putting a lot of uh, um, degradation on the battery side. Um, so by by pairing the two, uh, we know that batteries provide regulation already. We know that wind, for example, provides energy. Uh, we are interested in understanding how the storage could help us hedge some of the uncertainty, how the storage could help us hedge some of these autocorrelation forecast errors. Um, so 
I, I don't have an answer now, but uh, this is the, the line of thinking we are following that maybe by hybridizing, we will be able to capture even higher value than when we have the two resources individually. That makes sense. Thank you. It's about time for us to wrap up. So I want to thank our panelists for their great contributions and discussion today. And thank all of you participants for being on the line and providing the questions. This has been quite a timely and interesting look at some of the practical aspects associated with forecasting and operations, which is where the rubber really meets the road. As a reminder, we will follow up with written answers to the questions we didn't get to today. I would also like to remind you that we are nearing the end of the meteorology and markets workshop with our next session scheduled on Thursday and our final session a week from today. Thursday's session will be another practical one on forecasting reserve requirements and system operations chaired by my friend Aidan Tui of EFRI. There's no charge for the sessions and you're all invited to attend. Further information or registration is provided on the eSIG website at www.esig.energy. Gunnar, it's good to see you back, but we've got to wrap this up. Bye -bye. Um, thank, thanks again to the panelists and the participants. Uh, stay safe, and we look forward to seeing you again on Thursday. Take care. Bye-bye.